Today we, we find ourselves in the book of Matthew, chapter 28. We are at the last chapter of Matthew, chapter 28. We, we, we are not going to finish it today because I don't want to stretch it out uh, too long. What I plan to do just to go halfway and then next week, God's willing, we will just uh, finish up the rest of this chapter and bring the book of Matthew to an end. I think it's a few years now we're going through the book of Matthew and we bless the Lord. Most High God, I want to thank you for who you are. You are our God and we pledge that we will always praise you, we will always worship you. Father God, we acknowledge you as our creator, our sustainer. You are the one that placed us here on this earth and you have allowed us to survive up to this point. Father, you are the one, through your son Yeshua, said that you have gone to prepare a place for us. And if you go to prepare a place for us, you will come again and receive us unto yourself. Father, this is our hope. This is our confidence. And, oh God, we believe that you are more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above all the things that we should ask or think by the power of God and work it in us. Even as we open up the text today to look into the scriptures, we pray for the skills and the ability, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding of God. Let our eyes and our ears be open. Father, I pray that for a genuine interest in what we are discussing here today, the hearts of your people will be quickened, they will be revived, their ears, their eyes will be open to the truth of your words. We ask these favors in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. So we are picking up here in chapter 28, the last chapter in the book of Matthew. It said, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. Now last week we left off, we saw where Yeshua, he died on the cross. And before he died, he cried out twice, Eli, Eli, Lamai, Sabbatani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And as we close last week, we said that Yeshua, even while he was on the cross, he was looking for deliverance from his father. And that's the reason why he cried out, Eli, Eli, Lamai, Sabbatani, my God, why have thou forsaken me? We saw in the Garden of Gethsemane, he he cried to the Father three times in prayer and finding out if there's another way, if he could escape going to the cross. When you read in the Bible and it talks about the cup, when it said, let this cup pass from me. He's not talking about a cup of coffee. He's not talking about a cup, a cup of wine. The cup there is death. And when he asked the Father to let the cup pass from him, what he was saying, in all humility, Father, is there any way we can do something else? Is there another way? Can we get around uh, going to the cross? This is what Yeshua was saying. But the, the, he asked three times and there was no answer. So, you know, on when he was on the cross, he cried out and he, he, he felt forsaken. And we can't blame him. I don't blame Yeshua one bit for crying out to the Father, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbatani, my God, my God, why have God forsaken me? You know, if I, you know, there are times I'm not even on a cross. There are times when I'm in a situation and, you know, I, I'm crying out to God for deliverance and sometimes you feel like you are alone. You ever feel alone? You ever, you ever feel alone like you're in a valley all by yourself and, you know, you're asking for help and there is no help. And, you know, I'm glad that Yeshua the Messiah, he experienced these things. He experienced what it is to be alone. Glory be to God. You know, and that's the reason why Yeshua is so much an example to us. As I said before, Yeshua was an example to us because he was a man. If Yeshua was God, he couldn't be an example to me. I, well, I, I'm talking for myself. I don't know how you feel about it. But God can be no example for me. God cannot be an example to me as a human being. Can I walk in God's shoe? Can I copy God? God do something and say, Eric, I want you to follow me and I want you to do exactly the way I did it? No way. Even though we might say, yes, we can copy God. 
But we can't. But can you copy a man? Any one of you guys down there do something and say, um, Pastor, I want you to copy me or follow me. I am able to follow you. I am able to try to follow you because you are a man, you are a human being. And that's the thing about Yeshua, because he was a man and everything he did, you know, we can copy it. We see where he died. We know that we are going to die also. And we saw he's going to be resurrected. And you know, the, the, the resurrection of Yeshua is an example to us. And what that is showing us, just like how the man, Yeshua, was resurrected. That is the same way we also, we are going to be resurrected. I have hope that when I die, I am going to be resurrected. I'm going to come back to life. And you know where that seed of hope is sown? It's in the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. Paul said that if there is no uh, resurrection, then we have no hope. You know, we, 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 we just perish. We are like the, the, the beasts of the field. But we are glad that there is a resurrection. There is death and there is resurrection. Yeshua experienced death and he experienced resurrection. He laid these things down as a pattern, as an example. So we, when our time come, we are going to die, but that is not the end. Glory be to God, the resurrection will come. Just like how we will see in the text here, where Yeshua came back to life, we will also experience also our resurrection. Now it tells us in verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, so um, Yeshua, he, he, he died just before the Sabbath because according to tradition, uh, they, they, they couldn't keep him um, on the cross after the Sabbath. At least that is what we have seen in the text because he was taken down from the cross. You remember in the last uh, text that we, we studied, we saw where uh, after Yeshua cried out to the Father, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabbatani, my God, my God, where have forsaken me? He gave up the ghost, he died. And we saw that um, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a, a council member. He was a member of the Sanhedrin council. And according to what some other parts in the gospel tell us, he teamed up with Nicodemus. And the two of them went and they asked for permission from Pilate, who was the governor. Because they couldn't do anything without Pilate's permission. So that they can, the body could be released. After Pilate investigated from the soldiers, he found out that Yeshua was already dead. He gave um, Joseph of Arimathea the permission to take the body down. Because as I said last week, the custom was, when a person is crucified, their body will stay on the cross until it rot. And sometimes the, the birds, the vultures will come and they will pick that body apart. And maybe it might be a week or a week and a half, two weeks after, they will give permission for that body, the skeleton, the remains from that body to be taken down. And if the, the, the family could afford a funeral, they probably would bury that person. But most of the time, that body was thrown in the garbage. And had it not been that God moved on the heart of Joseph of Arimathea, who knows what would have been the condition of Yeshua's body, but because it was already prophesied that the Lord said that his soul, his body, will not see corruption. God had it to be that Joseph of Arimathea, that man who was, the scripture said he was a rich man, he came in and he was able to get the body of Yeshua and give him a burial. So what we have seen here, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. Now what we have seen here is that Mary Magdalene and those other women, they were watching from a distance. They, I guess they didn't want to go too close because of the abuse that was given to Yeshua. I guess all of the blood, the, the, the amount of licks that he sustained upon his body, these women could not uh, see or look on what was going on. So what they did, they go from a distance and they were watching. And these women saw what Joseph of Arimathea did. Took the body down from the cross and he had a tomb that was already prepared in the, in the, in the side of the hill, in the rocks. 
and he placed the body of Yeshua after he wrapped it up in a nice uh, living cloth. He placed it in the tomb. These women were watching all of that according to what the text tells us. And now we are seeing that the next morning they are here very early. Why are they there? According to what the Mark tells us, the book of Mark, because we have to understand that all of the, 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 the gospel, the four gospel give us a different narrative about the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. Each of them, John gives us a different story, Matthew gives us a different story, Luke gives us a different story, Mark gives us a different story. And uh, to be honest, you know, when I read the, the, the gospel, I wish if we only have one gospel instead of we have before. Because sometimes you are reading about a narrative in Matthew and then you find it in Luke and you see it's, it doesn't correspond with what Matthew is saying. You go to John, it doesn't correspond with what John is saying. You go to um, Mark, it doesn't correspond with what Mark is saying. So in my humble opinion, I believe if we have one gospel, if they, if they mesh all of the, 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 the four gospels together, and some, some, people, some people believe that, if they put everything together, some of the uh, conflict that we see when we try to put them and try to find something in each of them, that probably might have been um, eliminated. But here we see we are dealing with four of them, and the four gospels have different narrative where the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua is concerned. Brethren, I don't want you to take that from me. I want, I'm saying these things because I want you to search for yourself. You go and you look up the death, burial, and resurrection narrative in Matthew, look it up in Mark, look it up in John, look it up in Luke, and you compare it, and you will see what I'm talking about. Now, it, it tells us Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they came very early in the morning. And as I said, they were there um, before the Sabbath. They watched, they saw everything that um, Joseph and Arimathea did. But apparently these women, the burial that was given to Yeshua by Joseph of Arimathea, it seemed as though these, these women, they were satisfied with the burial. They, they figured that they could do something better, they could give Yeshua something that is more decent because they love Yeshua and what the book of Mark tells us the book of Mark tells us that they went early in the morning and they had spices they were going and they were expecting to meet the dead body of Yeshua in the tomb they, were, they went with spices and it's like they were going to embalm the body they were not satisfied with what uh, Joseph of Arimathea did because Joseph did something that was hurry because the Sabbath was approaching and he wants to get the body down uh, from the cross before the Sabbath so I guess he didn't have enough time to give it the kind of burial that these women was expecting but they went with spices but you have to go in the book of Mark to find out that because Matthew did not um, tell us anything about the women went with spices. What he said is that and uh, you know, Mary, uh, uh, they came, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they, they came to see the sepulchre. But according to what Mark said, they came, their intention was to embalm the body, take spices and put on the body. And it tells us, and behold, there was a great outbreak. So we saw when Christ was crucified when he died remember when he died on the cross the scripture tells us that there was a great outbreak that divided the curtains of the temple was divided and it talks about the rock quake and it says that there were people who came out of the grave after the resurrection of Yeshua so apparently this is another outbreak that the text is talking about here when Yeshua was resurrected, there was a great outbreak. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. There's a lot here that we have to talk about. And he talked about the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? You know, Christianity tells us that the angel of the Lord in New Testament times is talking about Jesus. They said Jesus pre-existed. 
So anytime you see the text talks about the angel of the Lord, because there are a couple places in Old Testament text where it talks about the angel of the Lord. And what they said, that angel of the Lord is a reference to Jesus in his uh, pre-incarnation before he exists as uh, in the flesh. But here we are seeing that the scripture said, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Who is the angel of the Lord? This is just an angel. We don't have a name. We don't have any identity. The writer of the text called him the angel of the Lord and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. So why did the angel roll back the stone? Did the angel roll back the stone so that Yeshua could come out? Yeshua couldn't roll the stone back for himself. So the angel come and roll the stone so that Yeshua could get uh, access to come out of the tomb. I don't think rolling the stone away didn't have anything to do with the resurrection of Yeshua. Yeshua apparently was resurrected. We don't know how long before the earthquake he was resurrected. Because as I said, when you, when you read into other parts of the gospel, I think it's in, in the book of uh, John, I think, John said that when Yeshua, he, he was resurrected, it seemed as though he got up and he, like, like he changed his garment. He the, the linen that he had wrapped around him, he took it and he folded it up. It's like he do some housekeeping. He tidy up, tidy up the tomb. According to what I think it's John telling us that. He tidied up the tomb and he placed, you know, the linen one side and the napkin. He folded up and placed it one side and I guess he go his way. So what I'm saying, I don't think the rolling away of the stone by the angel have anything to do with the resurrection of Yeshua or helping Yeshua to get out of the tomb. No, I think the reason why the stone was rolled away by the angel here is to give access to these women so that they can get into the tomb. Because you remember when Joseph of Arimathea put that stone there, it was a great stone. These women couldn't roll away the stone. In one of the Gospels, they were wondering, who is going to roll away the stone? We, we want to go and see the tomb. But when we get there, how are we going to get that stone rolled away? That was their main concern. But when they went there, the stone was already rolled away. And, and what he said here, and the stone was rolled away, let me go back over that again. And behold, there was a great upgrade for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat all upon it. This is a strong message the angel is sending here. The angel rolled away the stone and the angel sit down on the stone. And I guess the message the angel is trying to say, set here is that death don't have no power over Yeshua. The stone is rolled away. Yeshua already gone. And the message is that, you know, uh, death couldn't, the grave couldn't hold him down. The tomb couldn't hold him down. Remember, you remember last week where we saw where um, Herod, he told the high priest that they must seal the tomb. So there's a possibility, I don't know if they take what a seal or concrete or whatever paste or glue they use to seal the tomb. Or maybe they put some kind of an official seal on the tomb. But the tomb was sealed. This was not something that, you know, women especially could break all into. But here we see by the power of God, supernatural power. God's power is not limited to anything. The angel was able to roll away the stone and sat on it. To say that death had no power over Yeshua. And the same thing. We, when our time comes, brethren, when we die, death is not going to have any power over us. It tells us that the time will come when the dead in Christ shall rise for us, and then we who are alive and remain unto the end shall be caught up to meet him. In uh, Corinthians, Paul said, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who have given us the victory. Victory over what? Victory over death. God gave us, is going to give us victory over death by the same Yeshua. It's not Yeshua going to give us victory over death, you know. It's God the Father is going to give us victory over death. Now it tells us in verse 3, the, talking about the angels, the angel, well, 
if you read in other parts of the gospel, it will say it was two angels. In the book of Matthew here, we only have one angel recorded. In verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. You remember, I guess this reminds me of when Yeshua was transfigured, when he was on the mountain of transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah appeared to him and his clothes were shining, glittering. You see, my um, God, the Father, seems to like that kind of a apparel. Glittering apparel. You see, as though every time you see somebody from heaven appear, their clothing, you know, it, it's special clothing. And people can't look on the, the clothing of these um, heavenly beings. And it, it's the same thing happening here with the, the, the angel. It, it, was lit, it, it was shining. Uh, it was like lightning. It tells us the flash of lightning and his clothes white as snow. And it tells us in verse 4, For fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. So here, the keepers here is talking about these Roman soldiers. These Roman soldiers were big, strong men. These are the men who abused Yeshua. These are the men who took the, the whip and they, 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 they whipped him and chunks of flesh came out from his back. And these are the men who mock him. They plaited a crown of thorns and they put it down on his head. These are the men who take the robe and they put it on him. They strip him naked. These are the men that strip Yeshua naked. These are the same men who they, 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 they cast lot to get the garment of Yeshua. These are big, strong men. They were fearless. These are the men who um, the governor placed to watch um, the tomb. And here the, the, the scripture is telling us here in verse 4 and for fear of him the keepers did shake. These men they are not strong and mighty anymore. These men they were shaking in their boots. When you talk about shaking, you're talking about trembling. These men they, 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 they were trembling, shaking and they become as dead men. I don't know if it was a trick they were playing or what. But these men lie down on the ground there and they acting like they have some kind of fist hit them and they were shaking and you know lie down like they were dead men because they were so afraid of this one angel that showed up. And what the text is telling us here in verse 5, and the angel answered and said to them, to the woman, what I'm noticing here is that the angel totally disregard these men. The angel, like the angel, don't even give them, pay them no attention. The angel didn't look at them. These men on the ground, they're shaking in their boots. And the angel totally ignored them, pay them no attention. And the angel, in verse 5, and the angel answered and said to the woman, the angel is talking to the women. Where, was, where, where were the men? Where were the men? You notice that? The, the men, the disciples, all of those guys who was with Yeshua the Messiah, all of these guys that took over the whole operation of the church after Yeshua was resurrected. They placed these women in the back seat. Women, women was at the cross. They, 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 well, we studied last week where these women, they follow Yeshua from Galilee. And these were the women who were ministering to Yeshua. When all of the men run away, all of the men, they run away shaking their boots, pray for their life, and they run away, go and hide wherever they went to hide. We saw where these women, they never give up on Yeshua. They were there watching him when he died on the cross. They were watching him from a distance. They saw everything that was, that was happening. And you know what's amazing to me? We don't have any women writing gospel. Why? Why, why? why we don't have any gospel women writers? We don't have any uh, gospel. Well, it has it have gospel that was written by women, but it is not included in the canon. What we are seeing here, the eyewitness, the people that we can say is eyewitnesses to what happened to Yeshua is the women. But we don't have none of their writings in the gospel. The writings that we have is we say Matthew, and we say Matthew was an eyewitness, but Matthew was not an eyewitness. All of them run away. None of these guys were eyewitnesses. And we say the people who wrote the gospel, 
They, they wrote these gospels, some of them 60 years after the death of Yeshua, 70 years, 80 years. John probably wrote 90, uh, maybe 80 to 90 years after the death of Yeshua. So none of these guys were eyewitnesses. But what we have seen in the text is that these women, they were eyewitnesses to what happened. It was five, and the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not you. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to harm you. If I was going to harm anybody, it was going to be those big, strong Roman soldiers. But the angel didn't know them. He said to the women, Be not afraid. For I know that he seek Yeshua, which was crucified. The angel said, I know that you seek Yeshua, which was crucified. You know, you see that word there, that, that the phrase there, seek Jesus or seek Yeshua. I know sometimes there are preachers who is going to take that as a text and say we're supposed to seek Jesus. Because, you know, they will use all these kind of little um, uh, text that is not uh, really connected. It doesn't, it, it, it's not, it, it, you know, it, it, that's, this is not what the text is really saying. And people will take these things to make a message out of it and they say, we're supposed to seek Jesus. Brethren, we're not supposed to seek Jesus. We're supposed to seek God. And it's amazing that in Christianity, we give more honor, praise and worship to Yeshua the Messiah more than we give to God the Creator. And I believe that is disrespectful to God. You know, um, sometimes you're looking for a song that will glorify God. Most of the worship songs that we have in the church today all glorify Jesus. When you sing some of the songs that we sing here, all of the songs talking about praising Jesus, worshiping Jesus. It's hard to find a song that glorifies God. But brethren, God is the person that we supposed to glorify. God is the person that we're supposed to worship. When a person come to Christ, come to God, it's through Christ, we know that. But it's God they actually come into. You come into God through Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. Now it says, you see Yeshua which was crucified. So even the angel acknowledging here that Yeshua, he died, he was crucified. In verse 6, he is not here. For he is risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. The angel is testifying to them. He is showing them the empty tomb, but he wants them to have evidence. Brethren, there is nothing wrong when we ask for evidence. You know, sometimes we in the church today, somebody say, well, I want to see some evidence. You're telling somebody something, and they say, well, show me the evidence, show me the proof. And sometimes we think that this person is a heretic. Because they're asking for evidence. Brethren, evidence, when a person asks for evidence, there's nothing wrong with that. And here we are seeing that the angel, he didn't just want these women to take his word. He wanted them to come and look into the tomb to see that Yeshua, he was not there. He is not here, for he is risen, as he, as he has said. So Yeshua prophesied that, that he is going to re re be risen from the dead. Remember he said to, uh, I think it was one of those, um, I think it was the, the Sanhedrin or the, 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 the lawyers that came to him and said to him to show them a miracle. He said what miracle he's going to show them. He talks about the, uh, Jonah, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. So Yeshua the Messiah is going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That was talking about his resurrection. When he talked about destroying the temple and building it back in three days, that was also talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Brethren, this text is fulfilled in the life of Yeshua. But it's going to be fulfilled in our life also. Our, when, it, when we die and they place us in that grave, in that tomb, after a while, that tomb is going to be empty. And in our time today, they, 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 they don't just put people in a box, you know. I don't know if you guys went to a funeral lately. They don't just, you know, long ago, when they, you know, somebody died, they get a box, 
and they, you know, take the person's body, put it in the box, and then they put it in the, in the, in the, in the grave. That's not how it happened today. They have a concrete box that they will put the wooden box in to. In that concrete box. I guess that makes the burial more expensive. But the time will come, whether we are in a, a board wooden box or in the concrete box, the time is going to come just like how Yeshua, the, the, the angel is saying he is not here for he is risen. We also are going to experience that same thing. And that's the reason why I'm saying I'm glad that Yeshua is setting the example here for us. The resurrection was an example for us, brethren. Yeshua died as a man, anointed by God, and he was res resurrected as a man. And it means that we also, we are going to have that same experience, just like what Yeshua experienced. His death, his burial, his resurrection. We are going to experience all of that. Praise the name of the Lord. In verse 7, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall we see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, you know, I was saying that the, the, the other gospel, they all have different narrative. If you go into the book of uh, Mark chapter 16, if you are a student of the, of, of, the, of the Bible, you will come to understand that Mark chapter 16 came to an end. When the angels give these instructions, give the instruction to the women to go and tell the disciples, even said they go and tell Peter, you mean Peter by name. What the, the text is telling us, the, these women didn't say anything to anybody. And um, Mark came to an end. So what somebody did after Mark abruptly came to an end, what they did, they added another 12 verses to the book of Mark. And what the, the, the Bible uh, scholar will tell us, these men that can read the original Greek and the original Hebrew, what they will tell us is that the ending of Mark is not uh, in the original text. It's something that somebody decided to tack onto um, the, the, the book of Mark after the angel gave the command to the woman to go and tell the disciples. They leave and they were so fearful they didn't say nothing to anybody. So somebody, you know, wasn't pleased with the ending. So what they did, they add these 12 verses. This is what the people who are trained in studying the ancient manuscript is saying. Now it tells us in verse, um, let me go over verse 7 again. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall he see him. Lo, I have told you. So Yeshua is going before them, the resurrected Yeshua, he is more uh, swift, more fast than these disciples who probably was heading to Galilee. The resurrected Jesus, the resurrected Yeshua is going to get to Galilee before them. And not only that, he's going to continue to lead them. You know, these men, they forsook, forsook Yeshua. They leave him. But I guess what he's saying here, man, everything is going to be okay. Um, we're going to team up again. We're going to be like a family again. He already forgiven them. He don't hold nothing against them. Because the message is being sent here that he's going to meet them in Galilee. Praise the name of the Lord. And in verse 8, And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples uh, word. So they departed in the book of Matthew here, he's saying that they departed and they run and bring the disciples' word. And as we close up for today, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Yeshua met them, saying, All hail, rejoice. What's up? You know, in our time, we say, What's going on, man? Yeshua hailed them up. I could imagine that they were just surprised to see him. The disciples didn't expect to see. Yeshua alive after his death. None of the disciples believed that Yeshua was going to be resurrected. Just like none of them believed that he was God when he was alive, none of them believed that he was going to be resurrected. Even though he was saying that to them on a constant basis, none of them didn't believe. So when he hailed them up here, it was a surprise. Praise the name of the Lord. 
And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Yeshua met them, saying, All hail, rejoice. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So uh, these women, after Yeshua hailed them up, I'm going to stay in this verse today. They came and they bowed down before him and worshipped him. You know, a lot of people get confused when they see words like worship him here in the text. And what they're saying is that these women were worshiping Jesus as God. When they see the resurrected Jesus, they, they worship him as God. And this is not what the text is, is communicating. But what, what, what worship, when you worship, when you worship, worship means, the word worship means to bow. It means to fall prostrate on your face before somebody. If you are worshiping God, is a different thing. But when, it, when worship is connected to a human person, it's talking about falling down on your face. And what these women are doing, they are not healing and they are not worshiping Yeshua as God. What they are doing, they are so glad, they are so excited to see Yeshua. So what they are doing, they, they, fought, they fell down on their face before him at his feet. And they are giving him honor, they are honoring him. Even today, if you go to some places in the Middle East, that is the way they, work. they, they honor people. Even in India, they honor the elders by falling down before them. That is what worship and that is what honor is all about. So when the text said that these women fell down before Yeshua and worship him, it's not saying that they acknowledge him as God and they were worshiping him as God. What they were doing here, they were honoring him. And that is the same thing we, we need to do to Yeshua. We today, we're not, we're not supposed to worship Yeshua because Yeshua is not God. We supposed to honor Yeshua. God placed him in a dignified position. There is only one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Yeshua is our intercessor. He's our go-between. He's our mediator. We have to honor him. But the, the person who, des who deserves to be worshipped, it is God the Father. The person, the, 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 the person who the text said, uh, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. We're supposed to worship the one and true God. The same God of yesterday, today and forevermore. The Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. That is the God of Holy Scripture, brethren. We'll close up there for today. May the Lord bless us. Praise the name of the Lord. Most High God, I want to thank you today. Oh God, because even as Yeshua the Messiah was risen from the dead. He rose up from the grave. The grave couldn't hold him down. Even though the tomb was sealed, there was a great stone that was placed over the mouth of the tomb by Joseph of Ar Armatea. But Yeshua came out. Resurrection power from God brought Yeshua back to life. And God, I want to thank you that this is our hope today. Yeshua set an example for us in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. Just like how he died, we also will die. Just like how he was buried, we are going to be buried. Just like how he is resurrected, we are going to be resurrected. And Father God, we want to thank you because this is our hope today. Oh, glory be to God. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But we say thanks be to God who have given us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. Glory to God. We'll ask the musicians to come back.